We are in uh, Parashat Truma, and uh, we're finally building a home for Hashem, a very interesting uh, parasha with a lot of uh, construction details, but nevertheless, we're building a home for Hashem to dwell in this world, which uh, brings us to an attention for a certain detail that, uh, if you notice, a Jew, when he prays, he, she prays, they have to face Yerushalayim. If you live in America, then you pray facing east. And if you live in Australia, then you pray facing west. And if you're in uh, Russia, you facing south and so forth. And even in Israel, we face south, southeast, where we are. You know, if you see us, we're here on an angle. But nevertheless, we always have to face Yerushalayim. And if somebody is in Yerushalayim, then they have to face where Bet HaMikdash is. And if somebody in the area, the perimeter of Bet HaMikdash, they have to face Kodesh or Kodeshim. So, really where we're facing is we're not facing Yerushalayim. We have to face the Kodesh or Kodeshim, where the Ark is. This is really where we're facing when we pray. Which, uh, it's very, very interesting, because you have millions of Jews around the world that they're praying and they're all facing one dot in the universe mm -hmm. to where a little uh, cupboard, a little box is placed. The Aron Kodesh, the, the, the Ark. And uh, this is a very small box. It's uh, one meter and a half on 70 centimeters. That's the whole thing. Mm -hmm. That's the size of the, the Ark. But nevertheless, this is uh, where we all point to. So if we want to speak in our terms, this is the antenna to the world above. This is where we focus on. And very interestingly, there's a lot of details how it was built. It's covered with gold. And on the cover, on the top of the ark, there's a, what is called the Kruvim. The, I think in English they also call the Kerubim, Cherubim. But nevertheless, on the Aron Kodesh, this is what is placed. And the Aron itself, the Aron Habrit, I should, should, shouldn't say Aron Kodesh, it's actually called the Aron Habrit. Because why is it called Aron Habrit? Because inside is Luchot Habrit, is the, the tablets. And why are they called Luchot Habrit? Because when we were giving it, when we were given the Luchot, the tablets, there was a covenant done, a covenant in Hebrew, it's called Brit, between us and Hashem. And in the Arona Brit, there's the two tablets, it's not iPads, it's rather the, where the Ten Commandments are. There's a Sefer Torah that Moshe Rabbeinu wrote right before he died. There's the remainings of the first set of tablets. And that is it, and on top of it there's a cover, and on it a form of a two Kerubs, Keruvim, and we're going to talk about today, I mean, what, what are they, and what does it signify, and why is the Torah specifically talking about that, especially when there's a very interesting question here that we just read two weeks ago in the receiving of the Torah, Lota sekol pesel utmuna, you're not allowed to make any statue, or any image, or figure, how, how come on the most holiest place in the world, where the Arona Brit is, there is a form of a statue. So we're going to have to figure out, first of all, how did these Caribs look like? These Kruvim. There's many, there's different opinions how they look like. And more, more than that, what is that going to do with us? Why do I need to know that on the Ark, there was these two statues, we'll call it for now, till we'll clarify exactly what it was. But nevertheless, this is what we're going to focus on today, because this week's parasha, we're focusing on the construction of the Mishkan. The parasha starts by saying, mishkan betocham. You should build me a tabernacle and I will dwell in you. And the whole parasha, and it's going to continue in the next couple of parashot, all the details, how we're building every little detail in the Mishkan. And all the, the utensils and the vessels and everything and how it was done and... We have detailed information, which technically, when you're thinking about it, um, I mean, I love the Torah, but why do I need to know all these details? I'm not doing it. We, it was already done, and it will never be done again. Why is it so important to give me all the details? 
But nevertheless, if the Torah is telling me about these details, means that there's something to it. But today we're going to focus specifically on Aron Abrit. And there are two verses in the Tanakh that are explaining to us that the Kadosh Baruch Hu was, a, so to say, placed or parked exactly over there. There's a verse in the book of Yeshayahu in chapter 37. This can be found in verse uh, Tetzain, uh, 16, where it says, Hashem Tzevakot, the master of the universe, Eloke Israel, the king of uh, the God of Israel, Yosheva Keruvim, sits on the Keruvim. That's where Hashem is placed, so to say. That's where he's positioned. And if one would want to ask, where would Hashem dwell? So he's dwell, dwelling in the Keruvim. Now, why did Hashem needed that? When you're looking at the Torah, we have a beautiful, long Torah. 54 parashot, 54 portions, even though in the beginning the Torah was divided into chapters, not to portions. Later on it came into portions, but we have 54 portions. And these 54 portions are building 304,000 words. Uh, to be exact, it's 304,805. And not only that, we have the 40, 54 parashot. There are 12 parashot in the book of Bereshit, 11 parashot in the book of Shemot, 10 parashot in the book of Vayikra, another 10 parashot in the book of Bamidbar, and another 11 parashot in the book of Dvarim, bringing it to 54 parashot, which is a little bit of a contradiction here because we do know, and I taught that many times, that we have 53 parashot in the Torah. That's where we have the word Gan. Gan is a garden, but nevertheless Gan is also the numerical value of 53, Gimel and Nun. When we're talking about Gan Eden and many other places where it has the word Gan, so it's referring to, to the 53 parashot in the Torah. So there is a, a machloket if we have 53, but we actually, we just counted 54. How can it be 53? So the, the Gaon Chida, Rabbi Yosef David Azulai, he explains that this parasha, parashat Turma and parashat Tetzaveh are connected as one, they're really one parasha. Rereading it as Turma and Ve'ata Tetzaveh, but how do we know that it's one parasha? Because it says Ve'ata Tetzaveh, and you will command. This is called Vav Achibur, the Vav that connects, and parashat Turma and parashat Tetzaveh are together, are attached, and they're really one parasha. The reason why they're attached, because if you remember, after the sin of the golden calf, Hashem wanted to destroy the nation of Israel. Moshe said, if you're destroying them, erase me out of your book. And in the whole parasha of Atat there's not, uh, there's not the name of Moshe Rabbeinu. And therefore, the parasha of Atat and Turma are attached together. So there shouldn't be a parasha in the Torah that we don't have Hashem, Moshe's name. Of course, after he's born, because in the book of Bereshit is not mentioned. But nevertheless, that's how we got to 53 uh, parashiot, because when you count them, it's 54, but uh, when you attach, you get 53. But nevertheless, we have 54 parashot, 304,805 words. Not only that, we have in that the Ten Commandments, a hundred words in the Ten Commandments. How much information is in the Torah? And you think Hashem gave it all in one shot to Moshe Rabbeinu? No. Moshe Rabbeinu got the Ten Commandments. We, heard, we only heard two coming from Hashem. Then we got another eight through Moshe Rabbeinu. When Moshe Rabbeinu was on the mountains for 40 days getting the, uh, another portion. And then for the rest of the 40 years in the desert, there was uh, meetings between Hashem and Moshe Rabbeinu. He didn't get the Torah in, all, in one shot. Don't forget that when we're reading the Torah, from some point it jumps 40 years later. To be exact, exact 38 and a half years. But we're missing a big portion that the Torah is not talking about what was going on. But nevertheless, throughout the 40 years in the desert, Moshe Rabbeinu would go into the tent and whenever Hashem would call him and there would be a meeting. And where did Hashem, so to say, position, positioned himself? Above the Kuvim. That's where Hashem would say, that's where you're going to find me. And Moshe Rabbeinu would hear the voice that would talk between the Kuvim and whatever Moshe Rabbeinu would hear. First of all, Hashem would call him, by Daber Hashem and Moshe Lemo. Constantly, Moshe Rabbeinu was called in, and Moshe Rabbeinu would walk into the oil moed. He had a cover on his face. He removed the cover. But nevertheless, 
we know that whenever Moshe Rabbeinu had a conversation with Hashem, Hashem, the voice will come out from between the Kuvim, which obviously brings us to the conclusion that the Kuvim are very, very important. This is not uh, some detail to, to just uh, ignore. This is a, a, a very important detail and obviously Hashem chooses to sit between the Kuvim. Now, in uh, the first temple, in Bait Rishon, you know, when we have in the shul, when they open the ark, they open the first, the, the, the curtain, the parochet. In Bet HaMikdash, they also used to do it. And in Bet HaMikdash Rishon, in the first house, they used to move the parochet and everybody would see the kuvim. Everybody wanted to see it. But that only worked in the, in the first Bet HaMikdash. In the first, second Bet HaMikdash, we didn't have that. But nevertheless, everybody wanted to see how the Kuvim look, and besides to see the, this, uh, this uh, magical look. So, today I want to focus on specifically about these Kuvim, what's so special about them, but mainly what is that going to do with me. I always like looking in the Torah and not only le learning a historical event or now in this parasha, an ar architectural or design uh, concept. There's obviously some type of deep message behind these Kuvim and I want to find out why. Now, first even before we start, like I said before, just the concept that there are two statues sounds like idol worship. This is something that we got commanded in the Parashat Yitro, in the Ten Commandments, Lo ta'aserecha kol pesel kol t'muna. You're not allowed to make yourself a statue and, and worship it. Now there's many, many laws in that because I know many people ask, wait a minute, if you're not allowed to make a statue or, or a picture, tmuna, how come people have, have in their houses two pictures of tzaddikim, of rabbis? So anyways, we're not going to go into the halakha today about what's pesel and tmuna, just briefly to, under, to explain that it has to be something that has uh, what's called blita. Okay? So if it's a flat picture, there's not a problem. As long as once it gets a shape, then it's a problem. And when it comes to a statue, it has to be a full body statue. So some, unfortunately, even in our generation, some people have statues in their backyard with like a fountain or something. You're not allowed to have that. That's Mamasha statue. This is Mamasha Pesel. But nevertheless, in the Bet HaMikdash, we were allowed to have the Kruvim. Outside of Bet HaMikdash, any type of a statue would be already, uh, already idol worship. And also the Talmud explains to us that in the Kodesh Kodeshim, not only that they had the Kruvim on the Ark, they also had pictures of the Kruvims on the wall, on the walls. So in the Bet HaMikdash there was no problem. Outside of the Bet HaMikdash, then there was already a problem. Now, so comes now the question, so how are we allowed to make these uh, statues in Bet HaMikdash? Now, if you, we're going to jump one week forward, we're going to see that we, the, the, the nation of Israel, they sin with the golden calf. Which comes a big question. Why would they sin with a golden calf? We'll talk about it next week. Although I'm actually not here next week. But, but why, why would they sin with the golden calf? They really, somebody in their right mind really thinks that after seeing Moshe Rabbeinu leading the nation, now a, a golden calf, uh, an inanimate, he would lead the way. You know, what's going on here? So there's one opinion that says they learned from the Kruvim. They saw how the Shechina... The, was manifested on the Kuvim and they thought that they got the idea, same thing with the calf. And maybe the Shekhinah will dwell on that too. But nevertheless, why is there a form or shape? It's the, or, the only thing in the Torah that we see that there's some type of a form or a shape. And if Hashem is instructing us not to make statues, why specifically on the Ark there is a form or a statue where we are directed in such a, to, to such a holy thing. How can it be? Obviously, there's something that Hashem wants to teach us here. If the Kadosh Baruch Hu instructed us to make it, must be that the Kadosh Baruch Hu wants us to, to, to learn something here. And there is a, a, a parable to kind of start to, a, a understanding. And there was once a, a, a Caesar in the country of Austria, and you know, at the time, Caesars or emperor, emperors, they uh, before they uh, uh, retired, they wanted to leave some type of a mark. And like in our days, if there's a president or a mayor, 
they want to build uh, something that will be named after them. So also, a few hundred years ago, there was an Austrian Caesar, and he was about to finish his uh, service. So he wanted to make some type of a monument so everybody will remember him. So he decided to make an opera house, a big opera house. Okay. He uh, hired the, the most uh, amazing architect in the world, whatever, poured in a lot, a lot of money to it. Two years of construction and designing, and finally after two years, the beautiful opera house was ready. Something out of this world. Had room to have uh, uh, 5,000 people, huge, beautiful, unbelievable. On the day then when they uh, made the first show, of course, all the VIPs, all the who's and who's were invited. And there was a big orchestra, a big show was supposed to happen. And everybody comes to this beautiful uh, uh, opera house. And they're all waiting for the Caesar to come. Okay, so his limousine, his carriage is coming. They open the door, he goes out, he looks at the building, and he loses it. And he says, bring out this architect. What did he do here? What did I pay for? What is this? And he went, tear, tear the whole thing down. Break this whole place. I don't want to see it even. What did he was doing for two years? What was he thinking? Okay, and he leaves. A few days later, he relaxes. So the, the architect decides to go and see what was the problem. He walks in and says, sir, what, what was the problem? What did I do? I mean, I mean, I mean... What did you expect to have here? So he tells him, I don't understand why you don't have stairs. Why did you build it ground floor? You, a place like this, you would expect to have stairs. That the people who come here, they have to go one set of stairs. And then they get closer to the building. And then go another set of stairs. And they go and they get closer to the building. You build it like a football stadium on the ground floor. There's no build-up, there's no excitement, there's no building up to going and see this beautiful thing. So Lehavdil, not to compare, but the same thing, the Kadosh Baruch Hu wanted to bring to us a certain message. It has to be a, a certain build-up. Now, Kadosh Baruch Hu is prohibiting us and forbidding us to have a statue, in any type of a statue, but nevertheless, here, he wanted to make, give a certain message, certain, uh, build up towards a certain message. And to give an example how sometimes the Kadosh Baruch Hu, he gives a prohibition, but right away we see that we're allowed to do certain things, because we see here there's a prohibition not to make a statue, but right away he says to us, do make a statue. So we've seen many times that the Kadosh Baruch Hu does similar things. For example, we're instructed not to have any labor on Shabbat, not to do labor on Shabbat. But nevertheless, we are allowed in Bet HaMikdash or in the Mishkan to slaughter uh, animals. That's a labor on Shabbat, not to slaughter on Shabbat. But nevertheless, but we have Korbanot, we have uh, sacrifices on Shabbat, Korbanot Amid and Musaf, and you're allowed to do also Brit Milah on Shabbat. You know not to do that. So how can it be that Hashem is telling us, you're not allowed to do certain labor, but, ah, but in Bet HaMikdash you're allowed to. So we see that sometimes the Kadosh Baruch Hu says, this is something you're not allowed to do, but the, there is an exception and here you're allowed to do it. So we see that the Kadosh Baruch Hu does not allow us to have a statue, but in, when it comes to the Kuvim, Hashem says, no, here's an exception. So obviously there's something behind this. So what is this message behind these Kuvim? It's a, mystery, it's a mystery behind when you're thinking about it. It's not only us, the nation of the Jews, even the, the, the Gentiles for years. Nobody could figure out what's the idea behind the, these Kuvim. Now, even like I said in history, there were so many times that the Kuvim were questioned. What is it? What, what's the reason for that? How does it look? And there are many opinions how they looked, by the way. We're going to go through three of the opinions how they actually looked like. But nevertheless, it's interesting because any time you, you would see a drawing of it, they always look like uh, angels with their wings open. If you go now to Google and you'll write Kovim or Cherubim, you, uh, they, uh, everybody makes it look like an angel, type of an angel with the wings that are spread open. This is how you would find it. But nevertheless, the Ramban comes and says, you know what? 
You know why this is where the idea came from? Go to the prophecy of Yechezkel, of Ezekiel, and what does he see? He sees the, the chariot, the Merkava, and he sees tons of angels around them, around it, all with their wings open, and the angels are carrying the chariot. So they got the idea, okay, oh, the Kuvim are like angels, and they have these big, uh, big wings. Bechlal, it's interestingly, because anyone you're going to ask, Jews or non-Jews, when they draw an angel in their, uh, in their mind, or if you're a picture, angels always have wings. Who says angels have wings? You go now to any, any culture, and they, uh, you imagine angels, they're always going to make the angels with wings. If it's a nice angel, then it's little cute wings. If it's an evil angel, it's big scary wings. But who says the angels have wings? So like I said, Yechezkel, in his prophecy, when he saw the chariots hovering, he was surrounded with tons of angels, and they had the wings spread, because they were like, kind of like uh, gliding and flying it around. So the idea came that angels have wings. But nevertheless, let's now concentrate on the Kuvim. How did they look? So there are three opinions how they looked. The first one is kind of making sense. The second one is a little bit easier to understand. The third one doesn't make much sense, and this is what we're going to more uh, uh, really look into. The first opinion is by the Ramban. Ramban is Rabbi Moshe ben Nachman, not, not Maimonides. And he says, yeah, they looked like angels and with their wings uh, open. And again, he says, where do we get the idea from? From the prophecy of Yechezkel when he sees the chariot and all the angels flying around it. So the first opinion, the Ramban, he says, yeah, the Caribs, the, the Kuvim, they look like angels, angels with, with wings. And the Rambam adds on it that the name Kuvim is actually a name of one of the types of the angels. There are 10 types of angels. We mention them when we, pr when we pray. We don't mention all the names, but we pray. when we pray, we say Israfim, Chayot, Ofanei HaKodesh, and so forth. Chayot HaKodesh. So the Rambam says, Kruvim is a name of one of the groups of the angels out of the ten groups of the angels that we know of. Now, why specifically in the shape of an, uh, of an angel? Going again to the opinion of the Ramban. So... The Ramban says, this is the shape, how they look. They look like an angel. And, and what is it representing? It's representing that this is where Hashem is. <coughs> the fact that there's the Kuvim on the Ark, is it's representing this is where Hashem is. Now, in the beginning, if we go back two weeks ago, then in the beginning Hashem gave us the Ten Commandments. And after He gave us the Ten Commandments, He spoke to Moshe through the Kuvim. In the beginning, the, the show was on the mountain. Hashem speaks on the mountain. We hear two, two of the, the, the Dibrot, the commandments. Then Moshe brings the rest. And then the rest of the conversation is through the Kuvim. Now, therefore, right after that, the Kadosh Baruch uh, 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 commands us to build a Mishkan. So right away, we have where to put the tablets. That's where Hashem can, so to say, transmit his, uh, his uh, voice, and right away, that's the commandment that we get, to build uh, the Mishkan, in the Mishkan is going to be the Ark, in the Ark is going to be the tablets, and so forth. And from that position, this is where Hashem is going to talk to Moshe Rabbeinu and give over the Torah. Okay, so we have an opinion, we understand, this is the Rambam says, they look like angels, okay. First opinion, and easy to understand. Then we have another opinion, that the, these Kruvim, were faces of a male and a female. And Rabbeinu Bechaye says, first of all, this opinion, this uh, 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 can be found in the Talmud in different places, but also Rabbeinu Bechaye explains that the two carrots, Kruvim, they look like a female and a male. And if the nation of Israel, they do the will of Hashem, then they would hug each other. And if the nation of Israel don't do the will of Hashem, they turn around to each other. Like a husband and wife. Very, very interesting that in the destruction of the temple, when the Bavlim, when they went into Bet HaMikdash, they, uh, there was no ark there. I mean, uh, they already hid the ark way before they came in. But, like I said before, if you're looking at sketches, or if you're going through uh, the, the text, 
on the walls there are there are pictures of the kuvim on the walls in Kodesh Kodashim. So the Bavlim, the Babylonians, when they walked in, they saw an images of a man and a woman like hugging each other, and they were like, "That's this nation. That's what they were." Uh, their focus on a, on a man and a woman hugging each other in a form of it doesn't make sense. They didn't even understand well, why does it look like that. But nevertheless, then uh, the second opinion says it was a form of a male and a female, and they again when we would do the will of Hashem, they would hug each other. When we would do the opposite of the will of Hashem, they would turn away from each other. Okay, and again, this can uh, you can find some more in, uh, information in Tractate Yoma, page uh, 54, where it explains a little bit more of it. So the first opinion, Ramban, okay, makes looks like an angel. I understand if we're taking the the description of Yechezkel, okay, so the angels were kind of like uh, uh, transporting the chariot. It makes sense that Hashem chooses where to dwell, a shape of an angel. Okay, Ramban makes sense. The next opinion, okay, a shape of a, a female and a male, well, okay, but okay, I can accept that. But comes the third opinion, that this opinion is brought by Rashi, and he says, no, it was the faces of a baby, of a child, of a little baby, two faces of babies. Now, it doesn't say if it's a male or female, and you know, usually when you're looking at a baby, you don't know if it's a male or a boy or a girl. In our generation, then if it's blue, then it's a, if it's dressed in blue, then it's a boy, dressed in pink, it's a girl. Just the other day, my daughter reminded me, because I have uh, Rivka as the oldest, and after that came a boy, and another boy, and another boy, so she was, uh, hey, I want a sister. So when my second daughter was born, fifth child, then uh, in the morning, uh, Rivka woke up, and she was like, no, wh what is it? So I told her, boys uh, wear, uh, she said, but I was saying something, boys wear cars on their, sh on their uh, shirt and girls wear ducks, something like that. She reminded me that I said that and she was happy she had a, uh, a sister uh, baby. But nevertheless, you're looking at a baby, you don't know if it's a boy or a girl, so unless you see what they're dressed. So same thing here, so ah, she says, no, the two Kovim were faces of babies. And you don't know if it's a, a male and a male, a female, a female, a female, a male, two babies. And very interesting, it says in the Talmud, in Tractate Chagiga, uh, why specifically babies? Because it uses the word revaya, kuvim, comes from the word in Hebrew revaya. Revaya means to flourish and to grow. And babies, they grow. And uh, this is where the Talmud explains, yeah, it would look like, uh, according to Rashi's opinion, this is what Rashi says in the Talmud, that it looked like two babies. Now comes an, uh, a question. That doesn't make sense. Why would it look like two babies? Telling me the Karen Kuvim looked like two angels? Uh, okay, I'll flow with that. Telling me it looks a form of a female and a male? Uh, you know, doesn't seem so uh, appropriate, but uh, two babies. Why in the most holiest place in the universe? where God chooses to dwell and to transmit, so to say, His word to Moshe Rabbeinu for 40 years. And later on, when the ark is going into Eretz Israel, going through all the, the journeys, and finally going into Bet HaMikdash, and that's what Hashem chooses? Two babies? Okay, so I'm trying to get into the mind of Hashem, but what, 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 what is Hashem trying to tell me? What is the message behind the fact that if we go by the opinion of Ashi, that the two Kruvim look like babies? Must be some type of a message here, and I want to know what is this message. Now, we also have to understand what was going on exactly in Kodesh HaKodeshim. Because in the Holy of Holies, there wasn't much going on over there. <coughs> First of all, nobody was able to go in there. But what was really go, uh, what was in it? There was nothing much there. I mean, around there was, uh, you know, the, the uh, two mizbachot, uh, uh, altars, the menorah, the lechem apanim, but in Kodesh Kodeshim, it wasn't like a big uh, museum to walk around there. But inside, that's what the Aron Kodesh was, the, 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 Aron, the, the Aron Abrit. Must be something so unique and so powerful that this is where the Kadosh Baruch decides to, so to say, contract himself and reveal himself in this, in this world that 
Really, when you're looking at it from this parasha and on, we have just instructions how to build the Mishkan. How to build the actual Mishkan, the tabernacle, and then all the kilim, all the, the utensils and the vessels, and then the tent itself, and all the, 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 the walls, and the menorah, and the altars. We have so much information here, like as if I'm going to make a replica right now. But nevertheless, so much information. But from all these fancy schmancy stuff, inside there's the ark. And the ark is completely different from everything else. And the ark was always an enigma for, for many, many people. Even Indiana Jones, uh, even Harrison Ford uh, couldn't figure that out. But nevertheless, this ark was always an enigma everywhere. You know why? It was totally different from anything else. The menorah was beautiful. All the kilim, the utensils were amazing. The, the art around it and the wisdom and the way it was done. But the ark had something very, very different and unique that not, nothing else had. That the ark was a, a, a existing in a miraculous way. Because the ark didn't take any space. It was in a weird way that our mind will never understand even what it means. But the ark didn't have a measurement. Even though we know the measurement, but it didn't take any space. Imagine now you have a trunk and you have two suitcases. You put the two suitcases in the trunk, that's it, no more room. Here, imagine now you're putting two suitcases in the trunk and whoop, the, I didn't even take any space. The ark was is such a miracle way, a form of being that it, it says, it didn't have a shape or a form. It kind of like, I'm trying to imagine, disappearing in front of their eyes. Or it's a, it has a physical form, but it doesn't take any physical space. It was a very weird and miraculous sight. Not only that, the ark itself would carry the ones who are carrying it. You know how heavy it was? Nobody was even able to move it. It would ele elevate itself. Just imagine, even though it's not a big box, but it's stuffed with gold, and then the tablets inside, and it was so heavy, nobody was able to lift it up. And uh, there is a story in the Tanakh, that at some point they tried to put it on some type of a wagon, and it broke, and it fell down. The ark, would, it says that the ark, Hayam Masia et Noso, he would carry the ones who were carrying it, and the ark could only be carried on the, on the shoulder. No wagons, no forklifts, no ships, no trucks, they had to carry it all the time. And how do you carry such a heavy thing? Because it would elevate itself. It was a, a miraculous sight, just the idea behind the, the ark. Now, there's a very interesting halakha about the ark. And there's a question that Rambam, and not only Rambam, everybody's asking, where is this ark right now? Where's the Ronobrit? So some people say it's in the, in the Vatican. Some people say it's buried. The truth is that, first of all, nobody knows where it is, but it's definitely not in the Vatican. Nobody would be able to move it. And that's another opinion that I heard. But nevertheless, uh, not in Washington, D.C. Uh, I actually did hear an opinion. We're not going to get into it because that's going to completely sidetrack us. But I did hear a, a pretty good, uh, solid uh, source that the Mishkan is buried here in Tzfat. That in Tzfat, the old keli, everything of the Mishkan is buried here in Tzfat somewhere. And that's why it's such a... Excuse me? No. But nevertheless, I don't want to sidetrack now. But nevertheless, there is a question by many people, where is this ark right now? I, I, I want to know where it is. I want to see it. Nevertheless, the Mashiach is going to come. We're going to see it. But we don't know where the ark is. Uh, the Kelim, everything else, yeah, then there's a very uh, solid opinion that says that the rest of the Kelim, like the menorah and the altars, the Titus took it and it is in the Vatican. That's one opinion that says that it was taken, not the Ark. Why? Because the Ark, nobody would, able, would be able to touch and nobody would be able to move it. But more than that, we do know that 50 years prior to the destruction of the temple, they buried it in the ground. They knew that there's going to come a destruction and they built a special hidden compartment somewhere in the ground and 50 years prior to the destruction, there was a king 
And uh, Yoshiao, the king, he was a very righteous uh, king. Many kings that came after that were evil and wicked. But nevertheless, he knew that there's going to be a destruction and he buried it into the ground. Nobody knows where. Needless to say, I, I, I believe that because it was uh, such a miraculous thing to start with, that wherever they buried it, it just disappeared. And even if you'll dig now half the world, you'll never find it because it's disappeared in front of your eyes. Nobody's able to even see it. But nevertheless, Rambam says that all the Kilim, we don't know where they are. Eh, they could be in different places. The Kilim I'm talking about can be the actual vessels or the menorah. I mean, there's the famous uh, painting with them when Titus is older carrying the menorah. But specifically the Ark, nobody touched it. And as, as, and as we know, and Rambam says it in the, in the, in the book of Ilchot Bet Abchira, this is in chapter four, uh, uh, four, where he says that Shlomo HaMelech built a specific hidden vault that nobody knew where it is and how to get it. Shlomo HaMelech already built it, was already pre-built when they built Bet HaMikdash. 50 years before the destruction, the king Yoshiao, he already buried it and nobody knows where it is. Now comes an interesting question is, Rambam is not a, a historian. All the books of Rambam has nothing to do with history, has nothing to do with anything else but Halacha. Why is Rambam talking to me suddenly from thousands and thousands of, of, of uh, halachot, now you're telling me that we don't know where the ark is and that it's hidden, and that's not halacha. Why is Rambam suddenly telling me such a fact, such a detail? So here the Rambam is teaching us an actual halacha, and he says that the halacha is that the ark has to constantly be in existence. If there's no ark, then nothing else can exist. And definitely not a Bet HaMikdash, and definitely not anything else. So the halacha is that Aron HaKodesh chayav liot kayam. It has to exist. We don't know where, but it has to exist. Which means that right now, somewhere, the ark exists. We don't know where. Very soon Mashiach is going to come, and with a bulldozer, they'll pick it, take it out. It's actually not going to be with a bulldozer. I'm sure Mashiach is just going to say a few holy words, and ta-da! And we'll see with our own eyes. Just the miraculous sight. This is what's different difference between the ark and everything else. The menorah, it was amazing, but it's a physical thing and it doesn't change, or sh change its form or do anything. It, different. Same thing with the rest of the vessels. But the ark itself, if we, it says that our human mind will never understand what, really what it means, but uh, it, it reshapes itself constantly. But nevertheless, Rambam gives us a halakha that the ark has to exist constantly. Now, why? Because this ark is the communication source with Hashem. Hashem needs to somehow communicate with this world. It's through this Aron Babrit. Now, all this makes sense to a certain extent. But the only thing I still don't understand is why is it two babies? Why did the, uh, Rashi says it's in the shape of two babies? Uh, <clears throat> There is an important detail that we need to know. When they finished the Ark, when they finished the Aron Abrit, Bezalel was the one who was building it. And we do know that the size of it, when they were building it, was one meter on a meter and 20. 120 centimeters. 100 centimeters and 120 centimeters. It was a shape of a triangle, uh, uh, a rectangle. But imagine like a box now, imagine now a shoe box, like a box, an Ark. And on it, they built some type of a cover. This is called the kaporet. Kaporet comes from the, 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 the it's, it's the cover. And on the kaporet, it was one piece, was the kuvim. It wasn't like little pieces and they welded it. It was one big piece, the cover and the two uh, babies. Now, here is a machloket, there's an argument. Now, they have the ark, and what do you have to put in the ark? You have to put the, the tablets in there, and the Sefer Torah. There is an argument, what did they do? Did they first put the, the tablets in there, and then put the kaporet, the top? Or did they finish the top, and then put the, the, the tablets in there? You understand the, the argument? The easiest way to explain it, imagine now, 
I have a, a, a regular closet, a cabinet. And what do I put in the cabinet? I'll put uh, whatever, uh, cups and, 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 and plates. Now the carpenter, I ordered from the carpenter a cupboard. He's gonna come and now put it. Now what does the carpenter do? Does it, he drill it into the wall? Then I put my cups in there and then they put the door on it? No, no. He gives me a whole cabinet with the door. And then I just open the door and put my stuff in. So there is an argument. How did it work with the ark? Did they first finish the ark, put the tablets in it, then put the kaporet on it? Or they built it, they put the kaporet, the kaporet is the top, was a big piece of gold, and then after that opened it and put the tablets in. So this is just a detail. There is, there is an argument how they did it. Nevertheless, the way they did it is they actually did the ark, did the kaporet, the kaporet again is the cover with the kuvim on it, and then they opened it and put the tablets in. Rashi says, a very interesting detail, that there's no connection between the ark and the kuvim. It's two separate things. The ark is a box that was built in a certain measurement, and the kuvim, the kaporet, the platform, the and the Kuvim, totally different. it's two different things. The one has nothing to do with the other. You would think that this is like a, a, a top. That's why there is an argument, and the argument is between Rashi and Ramban. Ramban. Ramban says, no, first they built it, then they covered it with the kaporet, then they opened it and they put the tablets in. Rashi says, no, no. They first finished the box, they put the tablets in it, and on it they, they put the kaporet. This is the opinions between Rashi and Ramban. And Rashi says, no, there's no, there's no connection between the actual box, the ark, and the, and the cover, and the kuvim. So, now we want to understand, if the actual ark was the, the base for the kuvim, where Hashem would, so to say, appear and transmit himself, and it was one piece, I mean, the kaporet was a top, and on it the, the two... Babies was one big piece, it's called Mikshachat. How they do it, I don't know. But nevertheless, it was one big piece attached to the, to the platform. So, if the ark is a place where Hashem is uh, dwelling, and so to say I'm using the word transmitting his information, then why would it look like two babies? What's the idea of the two babies? And Rashi says it was the two faces of two babies. And not only that, according to Rashi, it wasn't even connected to the, to the actual ark. You have to look at it as two, two separate entities. Now, I want to understand what is the message behind it. So I'm getting a little bit of an idea what was going on there. But I want to know why specifically it has the form of the babies. So... There is a story, I, I believe I said that story in one of the previous classes, but I will say it again just to make the, the point. There's a certain rabbi in Hungary, in Budapest, his name is Shlomo Kovish. And he grew up uh, not, not observant at all. At some point, uh, his family was actually very uh, racist, very anti-Semite. Anyways, they did tshuva and he became a rabbi. He's now very big rabbi in Budapest. And to make a long story short, one day he gets a SMS message. And he gets an SMS message, message from a certain individual. This individual's name is Tsugadi. And there was a certain political uh, party in Hungary that was extreme, extreme anti-Semite and a uh, 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 party, political party. And this individual, this Tsugabi, Tsugadi, was, he was the second in the party, second ranked, and he was pff, vicious and did a lot of problems to the Jews, a lot of anti-Semitism, a very mean, ruthless, disgusting anti-Semite. And one day this rabbi is getting a text message from this individual, Tsugadi. And he says, I want to meet you. I want to meet me? And the rabbi says, maybe he wants to slaughter me, he wants to kill me. I don't know, what he, why would he want to meet me? To make a very long story short, uh, 
this uh, Tsugadi got into some type of an argument with some of the other members of the party and they were looking so, so some information about him so they can somehow kick him out of the party and what did they find? That he's Jewish. That his grandmother is Jewish. Oh, and then started a whole big problem. In the beginning actually the party wanted to use it for their benefit because everybody was saying you're too extreme and you're anti-Semites so they wanted to say no, you just look our number two is Jewish, we're not anti-Semites. <laughs> Nevertheless, at some point they went completely <laughs> against him and he, he wanted out and he calls this uh, rabbi and he tells him that he wants to do tshuva. Okay, and I actually heard, not face to face, but I saw the video where this rabbi is saying the story and he's giving it in much more details. I'm giving you the short version, it's a long an hour and 20 minute video. But nevertheless, you can find it online, I mean, the video is in Hebrew, but he tells the whole story. But nevertheless, now comes a problem, because this uh, Tsugadi wants to do tshuva, and one of the first things that he told the rabbi, he says, I want to apologize, because so, for many, so many years I did so many problems, that I want to apologize to, to the ones that I hurt. And the rabbi told him, listen, you uh, affected people, a lot of people, so your apology has to be public, whatever. So, at some point came a big uh, halacha question, what do we do with this guy? Up until yesterday he was a, a Nazi, then did a lot of problems to the Jews. Today he wants to walk into the shul. Can I take him into the shul or not? Like what, just did, he just came and said sorry and a smile on his face and I'm going to accept him into the shul. Now comes a different problem. Let's say the rabbi will be forgiving and the rabbi wants to bring him closer. But what about the community? Why would the community want to ac accept him? Maybe the community will say, we don't want this Nazi here. Up until yesterday, he would uh, go against us. Now suddenly he puts a talis on and that's we're going to accept him. Anyway, so they had to really see the, what's the halakha here, what's, what, what do you do here? They, uh, the rabbi turned to the chief rabbi of Hungary, uh, a known rabbi, overlander. And uh, anyways, he quoted... Uh, uh, a quote said by the Magid from Azrij, Rabbi Dov Ber. He was the, the follower of the Baal Shem Tov, the next uh, the processor after uh, the Baal Shem Tov. And the Magid from Azrij said something very, very interesting. He had a student, and we learn a lot from his teachings here, the Noam Elimelech, Elimelech from Lizhansk. And he called him one day and he says, you know, you know what they say in the world above? about Avat Israel, about having true, unconditional love, that you have to love the complete wicked person, Rasha Gamur, like you love the Tzadik Gamur, like a complete righteous person. That was his quote, the Magid from Azrich. This Rabbi Overlander remembered that, and he says, now I understand what the Magid from Azrich is talking about. You have to love the Rasha Gamur, a complete wicked individual, like you like a complete righteous person. And the, the conclusion was that he was accepted into the community. And he did tshuva, and uh, he became part of the community, and he did a public, a big, uh, public apology and so forth. But anyways, he became a part of the community, and he was accepted. So the story is coming to teach me something interesting. What is my connection? What is the connection that a Jew has to Hashem? We have obviously have some type of a connection with Hashem. <coughs> and there's different opinions. And again, we find the, uh, uh, two individuals that disagree with each other. Throughout the class, we see that Rashi and Ramban constantly disagree with each other. And here, there are two opinions. What is my connection to Hashem? The Ramban says, my connection to Hashem is my Torah. The only way for me to connect to Hashem is through the Torah. There's no other way to connect to Hashem but the Torah. When I learn Torah, I follow the mitzvot, I do what the Torah tells me, that's how I get connected to Hashem. End of story. That's what the, the Ramban says. And if, he says, the Ramban says, if a Jew doesn't observe the Torah, he's like a non-Jew. He's like a Gentile. He does, he's not different from, from a Gentile. If a Jew doesn't observe the Torah. And it says, what is the most sacred thing that we have as the nation of the Jews is the Torah. That's what we have. That's our connection to Hashem. Rashi doesn't think that. Rashi says, no, the Torah is just the way to express the connection to Hashem. 
But really the connection to Hashem that we Jews have to Hashem, the, the connection we Jews have to Hashem, is not through the Torah. Rather, we are connected to Hashem like a child and a father. Like a baby to a father. So we see an argument. Ramban says that our connection to Hashem is through the Torah. Rashi says, no, the Torah is just a way to express our connection. But really our connection is like a child to a father. And what is the symbol of a baby? That we are like a baby to the Kadosh Baruch Hu, Like a father that loves the baby, a mother that loves the baby. There's a special uh, connection. And our connection to the Kadosh Baruch Hu is this dot, this essence within my soul that connects me to Hashem. With the Torah, without the Torah. You know, there's a quote in Chazal, it says, Afal pishi she Israel chata, Afal pishi chata Israel hu. Even though that he sinned, he's still the Jew. So we see many people that they're Jewish, and they do all the sins <laughs> in the book. But nevertheless, they're still Jewish. They're still connected in a very deep and profound way to the Kadosh Baruch Hu. And the interesting way to emphasize it, that look in our generation, I don't know in other generations, but look in our generations, you know that a lot of the great rabbis in our generations, generation are Baal Tshuvas. Mm -hmm. Look where they came from. I'm not going to start naming names now, but if you, you make your own uh, account, how many rabbis in our generation that are considered great, great, great rabbis, and they're Baal Tshuva. They came from the, 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 the filth and disgusting places. So the fact that somebody is right now sinning, that doesn't mean that he's not connected to Hashem. And I always give a story, I'll give it very briefly so we can get to the point, that maybe two years ago, when we started uh, hosting uh, meals here, there was one guy who came here, and when we got to the building, originally the building was a hotel, so when we took the building, the part of the deal was that whoever booked rooms here, that we have to accept them, okay, whatever. So this guy came here and he was... He was such a mean individual. He was screaming at me that this is this and this is not working and this is like this. He was driving me nuts and the whole time I kept my mouth shut. I didn't say anything. Okay. Came Shabbat. Suddenly was a totally different person. Shabbat Shalom. And I was like, an hour ago you cursed me. Suddenly you're Shabbat Shaloming me. Anyways, long story short, we invited him to come down here. And there was a big meal here. Maybe, I don't know, 50, 60, 80 people. It's packed. And he was sitting in the corner and he was looking constantly what's going on. And at some point I saw that he's like observing and I wanted, I, you know, it was, wasn't a nice uh, uh, energy between us because he was really not nice. So I walked to him, I wanted to kind of like uh, break it. Then we started talking, I gave him a little bit of mashke, said lechaim. Anyways, we're talking and talking and he says, wow, beautiful, unbelievable what you're doing here. It's so amazing. I, I'm so impressed. And as we're talking, walks in a guy. Long hair, earrings, all of his face. Walks in with a girl that no question doesn't look even close to being, even being Jewish. They walk in here, he's wearing jeans, and they're both with phones. And I stop this guy, and this guy is a rabbi from a yeshiva in somewhere. And I stop him and I start talking to the guy and I welcome him in. Come in! And I sit him down, I, where do I sit him down next to me? And I give him food and, and I'm talking to him and... And, I'm, and, and the guy's like, it's Shabbat night, and he's, he's with his phone, and his girlfriend, who's not even Jewish, and I'm treating him like, like a king. And then the, later on, the guy told me, he's like, I, 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 I don't know how you do that. I would not even let him in to my place. This guy walking like this in a Shabbat with his phone and his non-Jewish girlfriend and his long hair and earrings and everything. He doesn't, he doesn't even respect the place. I would never even let him in. And I told him, but you know what's the difference between you and me? You, you're right, you maybe wouldn't let him I let him in, you know why? Because 20 years ago, I looked like that. Probably even worse. I also had the, the, the long hair and the piercings and earrings on my, hair, on my face and tattoos and a not Jewish girlfriend and not even caring about Shabbat. And I said, but I don't look at the external part. I look at this man that's 
you never know how you treat that person, what will trigger that individual. This man, five years from now, can be looking like me with a beard and teaching Torah. How do you know? So what if right now he's sinning? So? And you know, the same rabbi, Shlomo Kovesh, I was hearing from him a long, uh, 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 like a speech that he was giving, and he was also saying a story how one day uh, he gets a phone call, he, they bought a big uh, shul in Bud Budapest, and some one day he gets a phone call from America, and he gives the whole story, it's a long story, but the bottom line was that the certain individual that called him said that, uh, uh, He's like, I have to confess for you, to you, I'm a very bad Jew. I haven't been to, the shul, to a shul like 60 years. Okay, long story short, they get into the conversation. Maybe another time I'll tell you the story. But the bottom line was that this rabbi is telling this man, why are you calling me from America? I'm in Hungary, you come to America. So he says, the shul that you just bought, that's where I did my bar mitzvah. Wow. And this boy was a Holocaust survivor. He lost his parents. His parents were murdered. Only him and his sister survived. This, uh, he went to America, ended up being a multi-multi-millionaire. He built JFK. He's one of the, the constructions that built JFK, the, the airport. Anyways, so long story short, he, he donated the, the windows for that shul. To make a long story short, he was saying, this rich man, that uh, one time, it was a year after his bar mitzvah, he, he was bar mitzvah in that shul and never went to the shul again. And then one time, a year later, he was 14 years old, he met the rabbi in the street. The rabbi told him, why aren't you coming to shul? So he says, I'm, I'm not invited. So the rabbi says, I'm inviting you. You come to the shul. He came to the shul and the guy who was working there told the 14-year-old boy, where's your ticket? He said, I don't have a ticket, I'm an orphan, I don't have money. So he told him, no ticket, you can come in. And that, that's it. And he says, that's it. And I'm never going into a shul ever in my life. And 60 years later, this... Uh, this boy who was a Holocaust survivor, he, he says, I was bar mitzvahed in that shul. Anyways, long story short, the rabbi was saying, look at that, the person who was working there, knowingly, not knowingly, intentionally, not intentionally, one little act, you don't have a ticket, you're not coming in, sh shut it down for 60 years. The person was totally turned off from the Torah. I don't want to have to do anything with the Torah. So the point is that our connection to Hashem is not necessarily the Torah. I can be, or a person can be completely not observing the Torah, and he's still connected to Hashem in such a profound way like a child to a father. The Torah is a way how I express my connection. But it doesn't mean that if I don't have the Torah, I'm not connected to Hashem. And again, this is the opinion of Rashi. And you know what? We're all Baal Tshuvas, in one way or another, however you're going to look at it. Have you ever wondered what caused you that one day to pitom get that idea that you want to be connected to Hashem? Something happened one day. Doesn't matter right now, you look at yourself. What, something caused you to one day say, hey, you know what? I want to be observant. What would cause a person in the right mind to choose this lifestyle? You know, I always tell a story that one time, my sister, when I told her I became observant, she, whew, the easiest way to say it, she freaked out. <laughs> yeah, and, and she was like, no, no, she was like so upset. And, and the funny thing was that she, 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 she wanted to sit Shiva. She was like, I'm going to sit Shiva now. And I said, well, at least it's a Jewish custom. So, uh, you know, at least you're doing something Jewish. <laughs> Nevertheless, she, up until today, she's very unhappy with the fact that I'm observant. But nevertheless, one time, very briefly to tell the story, she calls me out of the blue. I live in America, she lived in Israel. She calls me out of the blue and she tells me, I'm coming to visit you. Is that okay? Of course, of course I want to see my sister. When are you coming to visit me? She tells me, I'm coming on Pesach. On Pesach? Pesach is the most extreme, hardest holiday of the year. That's when you're coming to visit me? Come anytime you want. Dafka on Pesach? Well, that's the only time I can come. And in my mind, I'm like, you know, on Pesach, we cover the walls with foil. We peel tomatoes. I mean, this is such an extreme holiday. Now I need her with her husband and the kids in my home. She's not going to observe the holiday. What am I going to do? So I didn't want to tell her yes or no. I call my rabbi and he tells me, listen, this is an opportunity. She wants to come. So show her what Pesach means. Okay. 
To make a very long story short, they came to Pesach. I told her, listen, you can come, but there's a few rules. You can bring chametz into the house. She's like, I'll, I'll, yeah, in your house, I'll follow your rules. It was such an amazing week. She lit up candles for the first time in her life. They heard Kiddush, they ate Matzah, her little boys, we put tzitzit on them every day, we made them put a, a charity in a charity box. They did so many mitzvot for the whole week. And the whole week they were with us. At the end of the week, finishes Pesach, we peel the foil off the walls, we open the cabinets, and my sister and me go to some, some uh, shop, in like a supermarket, to buy some ice cream, we want to buy ice cream to the kids, so we just decided to go, just the two of us. And we have a little bit more of a heart-to-heart -heart talk. And then she tells me, tell me, b between us, now that there's nobody around, just me and you, you really believe in all this nonsense? I told her, are you serious? You just saw the most extreme week of the entire year. And you asking me if I believe in this nonsense? What do you think, tomorrow somebody's going to come and give me a $50,000 check and I'm doing it for money? This is only belief. Why would I do it in my right mind to go so extreme on this week? It can only be belief. You know how many times people ask me, you really believe in, you, you think really your experience was real? Maybe it was a hallucination. Maybe it was some imagination. Maybe it's not true. And I have my, I have my answers. But one of the answers is that a human being in his right mind does not choose a life of an orthodox man as a, as a lifestyle. This is not an easy lifestyle. This is not that I'm choosing to lie on the beach all day long and sip on coconut uh, milk. This is a hard life. I'm not complaining, but you wake up in the morning at five in the morning to go into a freezing cold mikveh and you pray for an hour and a half and then you pray another time in the middle of the day and you pray at the end of the day and every time you put something in your mouth you have to pray and you can't do this and you can't do that. You have to be dressed like this and you have to be dressed like that. This is not a lifestyle that you choose because it's fun. You do it because you're dedicated to this lifestyle. So, whether I'm observing Torah right now or not, this is irrelevant to what I'm trying to say here. Of course you have to be observant of the Torah. You can't live your life not observant. But the Torah is not my connection to Hashem. It's just the way I express my connection. My connection is way, 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 way deeper than that. And the connection is like a father and a child. And you know, it's, as a father, I can tell you that sometimes I'm very happy with the behavior of my children, and sometimes I'm not happy with how my children behave. And you know, as they grow, they, I'm less happy with how they behave. Because when they're little, they, they're cute. When they're teenagers, they behave not exactly how I want. But does it mean that I don't love them because they don't behave exactly how I want? Or they don't do exactly what I say? I already a long time ago programmed in my mind, preparing myself, prepare yourself, Mr. Anava, that your kids are not going to be exactly how you want. Prepare yourself that they might even be completely the opposite of what you want. But nevertheless, it's my child. I would love the child. doesn't matter what they're going to do. So my connection to Hashem is not because of the Torah. And again, the Torah is expressing my connection. My connection is a very, very deep connection. And my connection is a simple connection, like a father and a child. That's where we see, starting to understand why the Kruvim were in the shape of a baby. And interestingly, I get this question so many times. Why are the Ashkenazi and Sephardi? Why are the Sephardi do like this and the Ashkenazi do like that? Why are the Hasidim do like this and the Litaim do like that? Why is it? Well, well, isn't it one religion? Why you do this and you do that? Just, to, just today, we prayed Hallel, and I announced in the beginning of the prayer, some people listen to the blessing of the Chazan, and they're including it, and some people don't, and they say their own blessing. You do what you go by. And many people say, well, what is it? I thought it's one Torah. Why are you doing different customs? Why do you behave different? Why do you talk different? Why? Because everybody expresses their connection to Hashem in a different way. We're all going through the same guidelines, but we express our connection to Hashem in a different way. But, nevertheless, the simplicity, how we express it, that's what brings this connection. Now, to conclude, you know, the Kovim were on the Kaporet. Kaporet is this platform. Kaporet in Hebrew means a cover. That's what it really means, the translation. And the Midrash says the, the word Kaporet comes from the word in Hebrew, Kapara. Atonement. is when I get an uh, atonement. And... 
the Kruvim would bring us kapara, uh, uh, forgiveness and atonement. And the real, the real desire of a Jew is to be connected to Hashem. Doesn't matter how far away they're from Hashem right now, deep down inside the real, the real desire is to be connected to Hashem. But nevertheless, there's always going to be this uh, if. If I do this, if I do that. How many times? I mean, we're all in the same place. We're all about chuvas one way or another. How are you looking at it? And you're always thinking, well, I'm going to have to give up my lifestyle. I have to give up how, where I, how I was brought up. There's always this, this if, what if, and maybe I'm not doing the right decision. Maybe I'm not doing uh, the right action. Sometimes you grab yourself and you say, what's going on with me? Am I do really doing what, um, or maybe something's wrong with me? You know, sometimes I look in the mirror and I am like, whoa, who's this guy? All I need to do is open an album and see how I looked 20 years ago. And I'm like, wait a minute, maybe I'm... Uh, Something's wrong, maybe some short circuit in the brain, or, you know, maybe I'm not behaving how I'm supposed to. But nevertheless, many times we come into this doubt. Am I doing the right thing? Is really this for me? Maybe not. Because sometimes when you go into the religion, then it's very exciting. But when you get into it, sometimes it's not so exciting. And there's a lot of, uh, a lot of burden and a lot of hardship and challenges. But nevertheless, I just want to say one last part and it will hit the nail on its head every Shabbat, every Monday and Tuesday and Monday and Thursday but less on Shabbat we read the entire Torah I don't know if you noticed this past Shabbat I had a lot of echoes throughout the, re the Torah reading every second word somebody says E, U, A, E, U already, uh, you know, my son is next to me if you notice, Yosef is next to me he's correcting me if I make a mistake listen, I'm not a robot, I make mistakes when I read the Torah, I like the ones that, you know, in the, during the time of the Torah, if chas v'shalom, you say A instead of a U, E! Oh, oh, why don't you, why don't you shoot me and get it over with? <laughs> Nevertheless, this is Shabbat, we had a, an orchestra. Every time, if I made an E instead of a U, everybody... So at some point, I said, later on, Yaakov says, listen, one person is correcting. I don't need everybody correcting. One person sits, and you know what, half the people who correct, they're not even correcting. But why are the people correcting? Because every little vowel, every little sound makes a big difference. If you say E, A, ah, U, not only that, there's a trot, ah, O. Oh. There's a reason for that. You don't just read the Torah. If you don't make the right trot, it's also a problem. One of the trots, it's called shalshelet. You only find it four times in the Torah. I mean, the sound, sometimes you, 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 the, the word will be like, ah, oh, eh, whatever it is. There's one sign, it's called shalshelet, and it sounds ah, 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 repeating. Only four times you find it in the entire Torah. Three of them you find in the book of Bereshit. The first time that you find it is when Lot ran away from Sodom, and he didn't know if to run away or not. The angels came and take him, but you know, his bank accounts were there, the gold, the real estate, everything was there. He didn't know if to run away or not. And it says, Vayemaen Lot. He was debating, should I go, should I not go? I'm leaving all the, 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 the money. And the angel tells him, if you're not leaving right now, you're going to be burnt. And he was debating, Vayemaen Lot. And how do you read it? Vayemaen. Like uh, swinging. He didn't know what to choose. The next time we find it is when Eliezer went to find Rivka. Now Eliezer didn't know how Rivka looks. He didn't come with a profile picture. He didn't. She wasn't on J-date. He just, no, go get a girl. So he was hoping, in the back of his mind, he was hoping not to find her. Why? Because he had a daughter. And he, want, he, he wanted his daughter to marry Yitzchak. Now if I'm going to find this girl, Rivka, then my daughter will not marry Yitzchak. So in his mind, he was kind of debating. And the same thing it says about Eliezer, that he was debating and the same thing. He was debating if to continue or not. The third time we find it is with Yosef HaTzadik. Yosef HaTzadik was seduced constantly by the wife of Potiphar. He was a 17-year-old boy. He has nothing to lose. He's, in a, he's a stranger in a strange town. And this woman, this beautiful woman is seducing and she wants to be with him. And he's thinking, should I be? Should I not? Should I? And the same thing, Yosef. 
Vayemayeh. He was the man. Should I do it? Should I not do it? Should I do it? Should I not do it? At some point, he was actually about to do it. It says that when he came home, there was nobody home. Why are you coming to the home if there's nobody there? Bala asot melachto. He came to do his job. And uh, the commentary says, yeah, he decided he's going to be with her. But then in the last moment, he sees the pictures of his father. Of the, the shape of his father's face. <gasps> he gets scared and he runs away. Yosef understands that he's a son. Yosef, in his mind, just imagine a 17-year-old, 18-year-old young man seduced by this beautiful woman and he wants to be with her. And he says, I have nothing to lose. Nobody knows that I'm here. My brother sold, my brothers sold me. My father sat Shiva on me. He thinks I'm dead. I'm a nobody. Well, 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 well even if I sin with her, so I'll start fresh. I'll... And he was about to sin with her. And you see in the Torah, Vayemayen Yosef, Vayemayen. Should I do it? Should I not do it? Should I do it? Should I not do it? And then he sees the face of his father. And that's when he remembers that he's a son. And he remembers that he is the son of Yaakov. And he cannot be dis disconnected from Yaakov, even if he sins, doesn't matter. And he says, now I'm going to let this sin disconnect me from my father. One little act is going to disconnect me from my father. And he decides to back off. And the face of his father causes him to back off. And then Yosef understands that if he sins, doesn't matter where he's going to go, what he's going to do, he's going to carry the sin for the rest of his life. Doesn't matter what, how much he's going to cover it under the ground. He understands that this sin is going to go with him for the rest of his life. And you know what wins? What won in the, in the argument or the battle of Yosef? The son won. Not the desire of the sin. The son won. The son, he, was the, he realized, I am the son of Yaakov. And he stopped. So what won the, 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 the challenge? The son. And the connection, this is what I want to take from that. My connection to Hashem is what wins over the challenge that I have. We all have challenges all day long. Because Hashem wants to see how strong my bond is, how strong my connection. Are you going to let go or are you going to fight? But the depth, the depth of my connection to Hashem is what will cause me to overpower the challenge. And that's what I need to take from these kruvim. The Kruvim look like babies to signify that we are also the babies of Hashem. And the fact that I know that I am the baby of Hashem, I am the child of Hashem, this is what causes me to be connected to Hashem and never be discon disconnected from Hashem. And that's why Rashi says it's not a male and a female, like the second opinion, because you know why? A female and a male, they can get divorced. They don't like each other. All they do is they say goodbye, they sign a few papers, and they get divorced. Rashi says, you can't get divorced from Hashem. doesn't matter what you do, however you want it. You can never get divorced from Hashem. So therefore, it cannot be a female and a male. It can only be a child and a father, the Kruvim. And the connection of a child is a, is a deep connection. The child has nowhere to go. A little baby has nowhere to go. It needs the, the parents. And the fact that I know that I'm constantly connected to Hashem and that I know that I have this profound connection to Hashem, this is what is giving me the power to, to, to fight any type of challenge. And the fact that I'm connected to Hashem in such a profound way gives me the power that, that I, I have the entire power of the Torah to win any type of battle. And the point I want to take from that is that we constantly have battles and challenges Every day is a new battle. Every day is a new challenge. And I'm ready to give up and say, I, I can't do this anymore. Needless to say, when it comes to the battle, when the, my connection to the Torah is challenged, and then I can only speak for myself, but I can also speak to many people, sometimes the challenge is so much, you're like, to hell with this Torah. I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to be observant anymore. I'm out. Leave me alone. I don't want this. But the fact that I know that I'm connected to Hashem, that's what allows me to overpower this challenge and any type of challenge that I'm able to reveal this unbelievable connection that I have to Hashem that gives me the power to succeed in every challenge or any difficulty that I have in this world. <laughs>